Hi, this is Stephen Saltzman, and you're listening to Cracking the Code of Spy Movies with Dan and Tom. Boris Karloff, not as Frankenstein, or in The Bride of Frankenstein, or The Mummy, no! He scared all of us for so long in those movies, but here, today, we're looking at Karloff as a spy in none other than the 1939 movie, British Intelligence. This is Dan and Tom from SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Now, Dan, I want to jump in here and give our listeners a heads up in listening to this episode. You know that we like to look at how a movie influenced another movie? Yes, we well, do. Well, in this case, I believe very strongly that British Intelligence, which released in 1939, had a big influence on the 1995 movie, The Usual Suspects. Okay. And it may have even influenced Inglorious Bastards, too. Now, for me to explain these influences, however... I'd have to spoil each of those movies. Include, I mean, all three of these movies. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put the discussion, that's the spoilers, if you will, at the end of this episode. That way, if you haven't watched those movies, you can watch them, come back to this episode, jump to the 32-minute, four-second mark to hear the discussion. If you've seen them, then just listen all the way through our discussion today. So if you want to keep listening, you can. If not, hang on. All right. I'm excited about this movie because we love finding classic movies like this that perhaps really are not the first spy movie that any of us would be casually thinking about because they are truly a find. And this one is exciting, not because it's based on a true story, but because it is well done and it incorporates real elements of espionage that were used in both World War I and World War II. So let's go. All right, let's take a look there's, at this. There's a lot of espionage in this yeah, one. Yeah, and that's the cool <laughs> part of this. All right, we all know the name Boris Karloff. And as a kid, I thought he must be from Transylvania with a name like that. I mean, Boris Karloff, even though he never really played Dracula or anything. But he's a British actor born with the name William Henry Pratt in 1897. Frankenstein made him a horror icon, but he has been in dozens of movies and probably made appearances in, I don't know, 140 or more television shows. But I never, ever saw him play a spy before. This movie, which was first released in 1939, I think it was released in the U.S. in 1940, this takes place during World War I and has Boris Karloff playing Valdar, a spy. Other than trying to get this horror image out of my mind with Karloff, <laughs> he does an excellent job here. Oh, I totally agree with you there, Dan. I mean, what I really love is he's got such an expressive face and there are some great shots in this movie that where they, yes. where they kind of close into Karloff's face as he's staring at the camera. I mean, it's, it's riveting. He's got that kind of a face. He does. Now, that said, <laughs> yeah. when we first see Valdar, he has this tight vest and his arm sleeves are really tight too. And yeah. I just started laughing because it reminded me of one of those old jolly chimp toys those oh were the God. you could either get them wind up or battery powered where the they're the the monkey that bangs the symbols yeah, yeah, yeah. and it had a vest with really tight okay. sleeves i didn't get that well, image. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure why yeah. i got that out of karloff here but huh. every time i watch this and the first time you see him i just start laughing because it reminds me of this yeah okay now, All right. I didn't get and now, part of it's the way he's holding his arms. Part of it's the tight vest. Okay. All right. So there you go. I did not get I'm weird that. that way. Yeah. <laughs> Margaret Lindsay is the main woman in the movie, and she plays several roles and is quite spectacular. So this is a good cast. You're yeah. Done. Now, there's another character I want to call out here, Dan. Yeah. And it's not because this character was spectacular to the movie. It wasn't a big role at all, but I'm referring to the Milkman character played by Clarence Duent. Yes, okay. Now, in the 1935 movie, The 39 Steps, there's a Milkman. Yeah. In this movie, there's a Milkman, and we can't forget the Milkman, or is it the Milkman, in the James Bond movie, The Living Daylights. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. What is it about Milkman in spy <laughs> movies? <laughs> there is one in this one, and he plays a pretty big role in terms of the unfolding um, of the story. All right, this Milkman. Yeah, he's, not, he's not in the movie a lot, but he's got an important role. Yeah, this Milkman in this movie is well-connected. All right, all right, let's keep in mind that the subject matter here is World War I, but the movie is being filmed for a January 29, 
1940 release in the U.S. So Britain is in the midst of World War II as of September 3rd, 1939. So this movie is definitely a propaganda movie highlighting the evilness of the Nazis and Germany at the time. On the whole... And they take that a little over the top. Oh, they do. And, you know, it's a propaganda movie. On the whole, this movie is jam-packed with espionage stuff. And really, not the gadget kind of things we see so much after from Russia with Love and so on and all the spy movies, but true espionage based on kinds of things that they really did and things that really happened in World War I. And we'll spotlight a few things like that. There are multiple layers too of espionage double agents and lots of suspense as we're trying to figure out who is good and who is not who are the german spies and who are the british spies wow this part is the most intriguing in the movie and you must pay attention because (laughs) things move rather swiftly this is only about a 61 minute movie yeah no you say you've got to pay attention (laughs) Yes, so, you do. I think I've watched this movie at least five times, probably uh, more. Yeah. And Margaret Lindsay plays yeah. two different characters in this. You said she had several roles. Yeah, she did. And she was a double agent. Yeah. And I don't know which, at the end of the movie, I didn't know which side she really was on. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Well, I think that's how... I mean, good, that's the how, movie's over and I still don't know. That's how good the script is and the directing is, I think. It is confusing and you have to pay attention. But I think, in the long run, you get it. So, yeah, she does play a couple of different people. At least she has two different names, Margaret Lindsay, in this movie. One is Helene, or one guy calls her Helen, or Helena, actually. And the other is Francis. Yeah, it's H-E-L-E-N-E. So I'm not sure the proper pronunciation. Yeah. And I don't think they were either. Because no. like you said, yeah. we got different pronunciations in the movie. Yeah, Frank, there's one character called her both names. Helena and Helen. <laughs> All right. Well, I think... Hey, wait, did James Bond continuity get involved in this? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost in the same sentence he calls her two names. All right. The basis of the story is that in World War I, the British are making their plans to counter the German offensive after the German invasion of Poland. They're making plans, but somehow the Germans are aware of their plans and are pounding the British troops as a result, as many casualties are resulting in the Germans somehow knowing the British plans. So, James Yates, played by Leonard Mudi, as head of British intelligence, must get to the bottom of this. So, Arthur Bennett, who is the cabinet minister, assembles the powers that be for regular meetings at his homes, for planning and for figuring out how the Germans are getting their plans. They think that a British spy... Their plans being the British plans. Yeah, their plans being the British plans. They think that a British spy who is in Germany is the best person they have who can figure this out, and they want to bring him back to England. So they send Frank Bennett, a superior pilot, to rendezvous with this spy in Germany at a particular time of the morning in a field. And he's told that the British spy will be wearing a white coat so he's easy to identify. Well, yes, the Germans get wind of this plan and shoot down Frank Bennett's plane somewhere over France. He crash lands in friendly territory and ends up at the Mornay Base Hospital, which we think is southeast of Paris, just north of Lyon. So now, Dan, you say that you said a second ago that they were that the the British were worried that somebody was passing everything off to the Germans. Yeah. So the Germans knew all of their plans. Yeah. And then you tell me this very detailed, Frank's going to fly this plane, the guy's going to have a white coat on or whatever, mm-hmm. a white smock, I think they say in the movie. Yeah. And so then the Germans know about that. What I don't get is when the, the general's in there and he's making the order and he says to, there's three guys, in, there, there's a total of three guys in the room, including him, mm-hmm. saying, I think we have a leak. Yes. Then it goes out and is told to another three guys. Yeah. Why wouldn't you send parallel stories out to see which one, which path is giving you the bad, inf- is passing the information on? Yeah. Well, you also see there is another, I, I, there is another person also well, that yes, could be Yes, but, I'm, sa- but I'm saying though is, even, forgetting how it actually happened, Yeah. the fact that six people were privy to that information before it was sent out to whomever it really was supposed to be sent out to, you would think that, okay, well, if I'm going to have this many people involved and I know I've got a leak, 
you think you'd send different things out just to see if you and try Which to figure story out shows who's up where. Water. Yeah. 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 But, so, but anyways, I, I digress. Let's get back to Frank <laughs> Abbott, right? He's, yeah. he's the guy that was flying the plane. Yeah. He go, he's in the hospital. He's recovering there for months. Yeah. And he's tended to by a pretty nurse, Helena von Lorbeer. And again, Helene, Helena, Helene, we heard yeah. all of them when yeah. we listened to this movie. But it's von Lorbeer is her last name. Mm-hmm. Now, Frank falls in love with Helene and he tells her, but she says she must leave and not see him again. Yeah. And then thinking he's asleep, she kisses him, then disappears. Yeah. Until a little bit later in the movie when fate does its work. Yeah. Now, I didn't think anything of this kiss as being necessarily a romantic kiss. You know, I could kind of see if you were a, if you were a nurse and you were nurturing somebody for a couple months and you had to yeah, leave. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, I maybe. Could, I could totally see that and not have it be a romantic thing. Yeah. Um, so, but, but her face. Why does she leave? You, you do see her face as she's approaching to kiss him, and uh, you know, looked like she had a little, little, little uh, concern on her face, like hmm, maybe she did like the guy. I don't know. It, well, it could like be because me. why is she leaving? Yeah, we don't know why right? she. She I mean, didn't that, tell him why she's leaving. Right, that, right. That, that's that's the key. The key. <laughs> it is the key. And it ends up she's being assigned a new spy role. Yeah. Because yes, she's a spy. Yeah. But who's she spying for? Huh? She she was in the hospital helping in France. Yeah. So and but then, which side is she on here? This is interesting. You yeah. So, but, yeah. but she, so she's a spy for whom? Well, a little bit later, we see her getting accolades and a special metal bracelet from the Germans. Yes, a special for her decoration. good work at Mornay. Yeah. Right. From the Germans. Sorry? Yeah. Yes, right. from the Germans. Yeah. So we. So it's interesting that that's where she's getting the recognition from. Yeah. So she must be working for the Germans. Right. And her, her goal or her objective is to deal a death blow to the Allies. That's that's being said right and there. And she learns that, yeah. And she learns that this guy named Strendler is in London, and he or she, we just know the name Strendler. We, we don't, don't know necessarily know the gender. Yeah. Is a German spy feeding all of the British plans to the Germans? Yeah, yeah. And so he's been in Strendler's London. Strendler's getting the information and, and passing it on. Yeah. So then we uh, we see her in London now. She's riding in the back of a car with this Henry Thompson guy, who was the German said was going to be her connection in London. So now we're suspicious of this Henry Thompson guy immediately because of the German who said that, right? So he has set her up in the Bennett home as where she's going to stay, and he is a spy as well. He will Wait, appear with the Bennett home. Didn't we? Didn't we say that that pilot was Frank Bennett? Yeah, that's so right. Frank Bennett there. So now we're going to see the Bennett home, and she now knows. Of course, she remembers Frank Bennett from taking care of him at the Mornay Hospital, base hospital. So she's getting assigned to the Arthur Bennett home here, and now she's like definitely in the back of her mind thinking about Frank because she asked about. So Arthur oh, Bennett, not Frank Bennett. Yeah, Arthur Bennett is probably the father. Frank Bennett was okay. the son, it looks like, because they talked about it. Wasn't there a son? They're talking in the car. Oh, yeah, I think there was a son, but yeah, he's in true. the Air Force in, in France, which, of course, the British didn't have an Air Force, actually, technically, at the time. It was called something else, I think. But anyway, so she's going to go to London and stay at the Bennett home, and the story behind that, why she was going to stay at the Bennett home and how Thompson sold Bennett on it was that... The Germans devastated her family, basically, and she escaped. And that's why she needs this place to stay and recover. And a bit later, when she's telling her story to Mr. Bennett, you see how good she is at spinning a story. She's just really magnificent in that scene. You will enjoy her recollection of things that never happened. So again, layers of espionage and intrigue, and we have to wonder what the hell's going on here. So now, we're definitely suspicious. Dan, yeah. catch what this cover is, right? She is so the Germans devastated her family, and she escaped. Yeah, needs a place to stay and recover. We're going to hear that again later. Yeah, with a different person. Yeah. So understand this cover story. Right, and, and now when her we hear name it again. Yeah, she's being introduced. Yeah, and when here. we hear it again, we should be suspicious. Yeah, but here she's being introduced as Frances Hawtrey. So not uh, Helene or Helena. Von Lorbeer, but no. but now as Francis 
Hawtrey. That's her cover name for this mission being planted in the Bennett home. So now you know, we're thinking, what the heck is really happening here? She's not Helene von Lorbeer. No, she's now Francis Hawtrey. All right. This is a great setup for us as the viewers because we really do not know to whom she is loyal. But we know more than Yates knows, and we know more than Bennett knows. Well, we do and we don't, right? Because we only think we know that she's this German spy because she's getting this accolades, but yeah. we don't know for sure where her loyalty is. No, are. we do not know for sure, for sure, exactly. And that's the whole main turning point of the movie, really. Who is she? And, of course, some of these other folks, too. So this is this is really intriguing, and it's espionage I love it. All right. In the Bennett house, there's this butler named Valdar who stoops and limps and has a scar on his face and who speaks French. I think he was a French uh, veteran or something. I think he was. But we know so little about him. So, again, Helene had been given a Wait code. Wait a second, though. We, we know so little about him, but he's the one that when they're talking about him after he leaves the room, they give almost the same cover story that Helene gave. Yeah. For himself, except yeah, yeah, he right. got injured. Yeah, right, he got injured. But the rest of it was right. almost identical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, too. So Helene had been given a code phrase, a sign, that if she heard it, would indicate that this is her German spy contact in London. And, of course, there was a counter sign, as there always is, that will be given. And she discovers that Valdar knows the sign. And she gives the cosign. <laughs> you got to love this spy stuff. Yeah. I mean, it infiltrates throughout this whole movie. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, they're, they're really using this stuff. I mean, obviously, they use signs and cosines in, in real spy stuff, too. So, here yeah, it there's is. There's even a brush pass in this thing that you see, too. Then, you know, just I love all that spy stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, there's a battle now. Now that she knows who Valdar really is, Bennett and Yates do not. <laughs> and we do not know where her alliances lie. So we are all in the dark. Our heads are spinning as to who she is and really who Valdar is and what he's doing. Well, we think she knows who Valdar is. Yeah, 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 that's true. Right. And Bennett and Yates think he's a spy on their side. And we get that later in the movie when they're in Yates's office. Mm -hmm. um, so this is definitely about that, yeah. espionage. Yeah. So no one can be really certain as to whose loyalties are where. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, so well done that it is confusing, but it's not so confusing that you have no idea what's going on. You you have some idea what's going on, and, and you're intrigued, and you want to know what's going to happen next. And this is kind of fast moving because it's a 61-minute movie, so things move. So, again, as these meetings take place at the Bennett's home, with the cabinet members there making plans and trying to figure out who this German spy is in London who is relaying the British plans to the Germans, a spy they call Franz Strendler. That's the spy they're looking for. Okay, now we know the full name, Franz Strendler. We heard Strendler before when Helene uh, von Lorber was getting decorated by the Germans for her good work at the Mornay Base Hospital. But they do not know who Strendler is. But now they must find him. Yeah. Yeah. Now this this Strandler character is a great character because no one's ever seen him. Right. Yet he's considered one of Germany's best spies, and he reminds me a bit of Kaiser Sose in The Usual Suspects. <laughs> he's a villain that everybody yeah. knows about, but nobody's seen. Yeah, that was good. And when I said the thing at the beginning about the spoilers, I'm going to talk more about this at the end of this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's there's some other ties back into the usual sus the usual suspects here. Yeah, that's good. All right. There's all kinds of intriguing scenes at the Bennett home with meetings, safes being open, and secret plans being taken. Bennett, who is an attorney also, has an office where there is more scheming and more secrecy and more spy stuff happening with codes, additional contacts, and vendors on the street who have suspicious ties, and lots more that make this movie a compelling watch. Real espionage stuff. 
and we're left guessing allegiances. Yeah. I mean, I, I talked about we don't know where the loyalties all lie. Nope. Now, we know certain things early, like Valdar and whose side he's on. We think. Well, at least we think <laughs> so, because <laughs> with every person we see and we see what side they're supposedly on, yep. we don't know for 100% certainty that that person's on what side we think. Yeah. Right. And there are moments in this movie where Hotri supports Valdar openly, and he's confident in her. Yeah. And there are times she plays it off with the British, and they are confident in her allegiances. Yeah. I mean, this is all perfectly played by Margaret Lindsay. Perfect. Who plays the same person, Helene von Lorber and Frances Hotri. And Perfect. she's playing both sides off really, really well. Yeah. yeah. You talk about a double agent. She's doing a great job of it. She is. She's doing a terrific job. And there's additional intrigue as Frank, the young pilot who was shot down in France when he was trying to pick up the best British spy, and she he was nursed back to health by her, Helene. She, he shows up at the Bennett house. Of course, it's his home. And as it turns out, he is Arthur Bennett's son. So she kind of was suspicious that this may happen, or at least that this was his home. And now he shows up. And there are some great moments there as Hawtrey and Frank interact. And remember, Frank was in love with Helene at the hospital, and Helene kissed him before she left the hospital, and there's some great conversation that goes on there, enlightening conversation, and perfectly played by both actors, Bruce Lester, who plays Frank, and, of course, Margaret Lindsay. All right. There are some special ways of communicating secret plans to the Germans that are used here in British intelligence. I'd say the gadget, if there were any gadgets used here, was the carrier pigeon. Yeah. We see early on that carrier pigeons were used to transport secret messages. Realistic? Yeah. In World War I, carrier pigeons were indeed used to carry messages. They have a natural homing ability and... They were used to a degree in World War II as well, mostly used when radio communications were either impossible or thought to be too risky as they may be intercepted. So this was kind of cool. This was kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, no, this wasn't just the World, world War I and World War II. Homing pigeons were used back like in 1150 in Baghdad and yeah. Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan yeah. supposedly used them as well. Okay. On Wikipedia, there's an unsighted reference to Egypt using them in 3000 BCE. Okay. <laughs> and as recently as 2002, India's police pigeon server was retired. Wow. So <laughs> I, you, I hope with a good plan. These things have been used. <laughs> yeah, and then some of these pigeons gain some status. Mm. Right? So in World War 1, a homing pigeon called Cherami mm. was awarded the Croix de Guerre. And this is the World War 1 French military decoration awarded to soldiers for wow. valorous service. Wow. Yet they awarded it to this pigeon. Wow. And then in World War II, 32 homing pigeons won the Dickin Medal, which was given to honor animals. Okay. And it's kind of considered the animal's Victoria Cross. Yeah. <laughs> so these homing pigeons have a long history in espionage. Yeah, I love and it. the ability to the ability to carry information. I love it. So this idea is a real idea, really used during the wars and used here in British intelligence. Quite remarkable technology. <laughs> yeah, the one thing the one thing that disappointed me was the message was sent in German and they showed it to you in English. You know, they they super you know, they morphed English it or changed it over to English. Yeah. But you would have thought that it would have been sent in encrypted with some kind of cryptographic code. Yeah, that pigeon's so only going the, one place. <laughs> well, yeah, but what if it dies or something and, you know, it gets hit by something? Yeah, know? that's true. It should have been encrypted. I, I agree. Yeah, it should have been encrypted. Yeah, it would have been better. <laughs> All right, so we see this this technology with the, with the carrier pigeons, and we see spies embedded in other countries, and spies who altered the course of the war were absolutely real in World War I and World War II. This was a natural thing spies embedded in other countries was part of the game of the espionage game in in the wars so i looked at an article on espionage by this emmanuel de brun and he says this the warring sides were committed to espionage behind enemy lines and in the neutral countries but also performed other tasks such as 
tapping radio communications, sabotage, counterintelligence, and propaganda. The secret war was also fought in the mind as all warring societies were consumed by spy mania and began to recognize their own spies as true heroes and heroines. So this was a big part of the war and this movie is 100% focused on it. I love it. British intelligence is full of spies, secret messages, radio and carrier pigeon communications, codes, and all spy stuff that you can imagine, except for all the gadgets that we've come accustomed to in spy movies from the 60s on. Though, we have had some gadgets in previous spy movies as well. British intelligence is about the real, believable espionage that occurred regularly during World War I. We like that. Yeah, and there's a plethora of scenes where Frances Hawtrey is in, where we question whose side she's on, as I yeah, said. It yeah. seems she's playing both sides against each other. Yeah. And I think that is something that we don't see enough of in spy movies. Yes, you see double agents, mm-hmm. but played this this strongly in this way. And I don't think we see enough of that. So I think you're going to enjoy these scenes and trying to reason out a solution. And like I said, I've watched this movie multiple times. I still don't know which side she really was on. Yeah. And I love that there are times when things are overheard, which change the course of the plans and relationships. It's, it's all kind of magnificent. And regardless of how she gets caught saying something to who, she's got a cover story for it. It's just fantastic. One great scene is outside with Valdar overhearing a conversation. You feel like you're actually there eavesdropping as well. That's how well done those scenes are. So it's really well directed and well done. Yeah, and I think that that there's a point where the typewriter becomes a uh-huh. gadget for communication. Yeah, that's good. And I guess you could call call it a gadget. It actually ended up being a stupid way to do it, but yeah, it well. was an interesting way to try to do a form of communication. Yeah using a typewriter yeah it was repurposed uh, for a particular use yeah all right this movie was directed by we just said how good it was directed it was directed by terry o morris and the storyline unfolds as we said quickly since it's only 61 minutes morris directed other movies like the 1939 waterfront godzilla king of the monsters in 1956 young dillinger in 1965 and lots more He was editor for one of the best movies, The List of Adrian Messenger. Awesome movie. Nice, crisp... You like that one. Yeah. Nice, crisp, black and white photography by cinematographer Sid Hickox and music by Heinz Eric Reimheld, which is not overwhelming and not underwhelming, but just seems perfectly right. There are nice moments like the music that surrounds the flight of the pigeon, the carrier pigeon, as it's leaving. It's just excellent. The composer was actually born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the United States. He composed, arranged, and or conducted music for over 400 movies. So this is no fluff here. Good in, thing he couldn't find a job. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, Raimheld was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Music, scoring of a musical picture for 1941's The Strawberry Blonde, and won with Raymond Heindorf the 1942 Academy Award for Best Music, scoring of a musical picture for Yankee Doodle Dandy. That's pretty cool. That was a terrific musical. Awesome stuff. Yeah, now, Dan, he's also got another big one. <laughs> yeah, mention like, that. Every every movie fan knows Gone with the Wind, yeah. which was released in 1940. Well, Raymond held ghost wrote music for the burning of Atlanta and the rape scenes in that movie. Two of the biggest. So he didn't receive any credit, but he was definitely had his hands involved. Yeah, wow. So that's, that's pretty cool. That is cool. All right. British Intelligence is also based on a stage play by Anthony Paul Kelly, Three Faces East. It opened in New York City actually on August 13th, 1918, produced by George M. Cohan. Uh, hello, Yankee Doodle Landy, George M. Cohan. All right, Lee Katz adapted the 1918 stage play, which had a couple of previous film adaptations under its original title in 1926 with Clive Brook as Veldar and in 1930 with Eric Von Stroem as Veldar. Now, we think... Yeah, now, one of the things with those dates, Dan, and you're talking about the play and these other movies, you it was easier to tell they were timed for World War One. Yeah, oh yeah. Because by the time they released this this version of it... Yeah. 
it you know we're into the second world war at that point that's true but i think this is probably why the storyline is very tight in this movie that we're talking about today british intelligence and it's so good because the story had been played out 300 times on the stage already and in two previous film versions so that might have helped with the screenplay here written by lee katz all right well, Pretty it would have to be tight. It's only 61 minutes long, and they packed a lot into it. And there isn't a wasted minute. It's perfect, really. Yeah. The sets are great, too. Let's just give a little nod to the set designer. Bennett's home is well-appointed and has that comfortable feel to it. We see a lot of the home because a lot of the movie takes place in that home. But all the other shots are great as well. The vendor on the street, the, you talk about the milkman and his cart, the foliage. The lighting is fantastic as well. When we see Valdar looking over some papers in the library, the lighting hits half of his face, and it, he looks scary. And then when he and Francis Hotry are talking in that same room with just the fireplace light dancing on their faces, it's fantastic. It sets a mood of suspense. Karloff is so expressive. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. His face says a million words. And we, you know, again, we're not knowing what Valdar will do with that look on his face of suspense and so on it's just perfect beautiful we think british intelligence is a movie worth your watch it's only 61 minutes long and so it's really a no-brainer to add this spy movie to your bank of spy movies that you've watched yes you'll gain some insights as it is well done it's well acted has a very solid storyline and gives us a glimpse into the atmosphere of the world that existed both for World War I and at the beginning of World War II. Yes. So it's a period piece that really gets you there, into the, it sets you in that period. Yeah. It's worth watching just for Margaret Lindsay's performances. She's just spectacular. And, of course, Boris Karloff, first rate. Anyway, Margaret Lindsay, she was in a few other movies of note, as in the 1930s and 40s as well. The Law in Her Hands, 1936. Jezebel, 1938. A Tragedy at Midnight, 1942. Scarlet Street, 1945. And Boris Karloff, of course, as we said, terrific. He has that Boris Karloff look of his that is disarming and frightening. Okay, so this is the point where we're going to start getting into the spoilers. Because we didn't want to give you at the beginning here how the movie ends. Yeah. But in order to talk about these relationships with British intelligence, the usual suspects, and Inglorious Bastards, we are going to have to do a little bit of spoiling along the way. So if you haven't seen all three of these movies, our suggestion is stop listening. We love it when you listen to us, but stop, <laughs> go watch the movies, and then come back here at the end of this episode so you can hear what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, or if you've seen them, keep listening. All right. Yeah, yeah. If you've seen them, keep listening. But you have been warned we're going to get into spoilers right now. Yeah. And so, Dan, when I told you I thought there was a link with The Usual Suspects, you watched that movie and you thought there might be a link there. So tell me what you thought you saw. Well, obviously, both, movie, both movies have a villain identified by name, but no one has seen them and no one knows who he okay, is. Okay, so that's Kaiser Soze and Strendler. And Strendler. Yet, uh, he's a central character in both of the movies and uh, under some kind of pseudonym or, or whatever, we don't really know. And that's all I really got out of that so far. Okay, so that's that's a good start to this discussion. Okay. But if we think about this, and again, spoilers right now, as soon as I and start And this is going to be a spoiler again, even for British intelligence here you're talking about. Even for British intelligence. So, so Valdar is really Strendler. And in The Usual Suspects, Verbal Kint is really Kaiser Sose. Yeah. Now we don't find out about this until the end of either until the end of both movies. Yes. Right. There are some clues along the way, but we don't know for sure that's what happens and that's who these guys are until the end. Mm -hmm. And so let's take this a little bit deeper. And the first thing is both Valdar and Verbal Kint have physical deformities yeah. and they have very heavy limps. That's true. Most of the time. Yeah, they have the villains having physical deformities is quite common in spy movies for some reason, but yeah. yeah and right. most of the Bond movies, yeah. they've got something, right? Yeah. Now, this is the key point to the spoiler, though. At the very end of The Usual Suspects, when we find out who Kaiser Soze is, yeah. Verbal Kint loses his limp and also his deformed hand, 
and he starts walking normally. Yeah. And his hand really relaxes. That was a good. As we, I mean, just as we're realizing, okay, this guy wasn't who we thought throughout this whole movie. Mm-hmm. Now, in British intelligence, there's a big clue at about 37 minutes in. Yates and Bennett are in Yates's office talking to two other guys. Mm-hmm. And Valdar enters, and he, he's hunched over, he's limping, he's using his cane. And as soon as one of the two guys' name was Crichton and the other guy leave Yates' office, Valdar stands up tall and walks over to Bennett and Yates, and he doesn't have a limp. Mm-hmm. He's no longer hunched over as well. So this was a giveaway to me that something was up with Valdar. Mm-hmm. Now, it's possible this was just a continuity uh, error. I mean, we've got Helene, Helena, yeah, yeah. Helena. I mean, when, I mean, it's possible. Yeah. But I think Karloff is way too good an actor for this to be a continuity error. Yeah, I, don't know. I noticed a couple of times that he lost his limp or exaggerated uh, maybe a little bit. A couple of times in British intelligence, but yeah, so I thought maybe he he did goof up, but maybe he didn't. I don't know. Maybe it was part of yeah, because he, he's he's the walking fine, he and then as he gets back to the door to yeah. leave, he starts limping again. Yeah, so maybe so it, it was telling me that there's something up with this guy, mm-hmm. right? And he's talking to Yates and Bennett like he's a he's a spy for the British mm-hmm. you know maybe he's really French spying for the British or whatever but he's on their side yeah All right. okay then Valdar has a line where he says there is something about every one of those slimy dogs that gives them away <laughs> now this is brilliant because was his lack of a limp giving himself away at the time is that what he was really telling us the audience mm-hmm Right. Was that a little subliminal thing to get us there? Okay. I like that. And then that. the conversation moves to the importance of catching Strendler. But I think the change in his walk gives it away. I think the line about the slimy dogs was really a wink at us. Mm-hmm. And then, as I said before, when Valdar opens that door to leave, he starts hunching over and limping again. Yeah. And yeah. he also loses the limp at the end of the movie when he identifies his true self to Francis. Yeah. So yeah. I, I want to believe that Karlov's interpretation of Valdar influenced verbal kint in The Usual Suspects. Okay. All right. right. But there is a point where Valdar says that you got to stay in character all the time, though. He tells uh, Helene that. Uh, Yeah. uh, Yeah. So. Yeah, he does. I don't know but he doesn't. how this all fits. But then again, yeah. when, when he was in Bates and Ye- Ye- Yates and Bennett's office, was he staying in character for them? I, that's Hey, I'm no know. longer this limping guy here. I'm this other guy that's yeah. trying to help you out. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, there's some layers right, of confusion so, there. <laughs> yeah, there's some definite layers there. So that's the tie-in with The Usual Suspects. Okay. Now let's talk about Inglorious Bastards. In that movie, there's a plot to kill Hitler, Bormann, Goebbels, and Goring. Mm-hmm. And because they would all be in one place to watch a movie and they'd be taken out. Okay. That's really what the team, what the bastards team is really trying to do here. Mm-hmm. Well, in British intelligence, Strendler's plan is to blow up the Bennett house while all of the British cabinet members are attending a meeting in the house. Yep. So did this plot point influence what happens in Inglorious Bastards? I don't know for sure, but the concept definitely feels similar to me. But so those spoilers are how I look at British intelligence and how I think it may have influenced both Inglorious Bastards and The Usual Suspects. Yeah. Now, you the listener, what do you think? Let us know by dropping us an email to info at spymovienavigator.com. Yeah, let us know what you think. All right. I'm not sure about all those connections. I think there might be something to that. But I do know that this episode will enhance your viewing experience of British intelligence because that is a fantastic movie that you should absolutely spend 61 minutes watching. It was available on Prime, I believe, as of this recording, and it may be on other streaming platforms as well. Again, British intelligence. All right, so that's a wrap. This has been Dan and Tom of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Please subscribe to our show through your favorite podcast app and give us a five-star review in your app as well. That helps keep the show going. We thank you for listening because we really appreciate you spending time with us. Thanks.